Welcome. I'm Dr. Carrie Mendoza from Fair in Medicine, and I am so pleased uh, tonight that we have uh, the group from Gender Exploratory Therapy Association, or GEDA, to uh, share with us their new clinical guide. Um, I know we uh, have some folks uh, rolling in. It takes a, a minute here for uh, the Zoom um, format to get everyone in. So we'll just give it a, a few more seconds here, but uh, the GEDA team is gonna take over and share their wonderful presentation. So I just wanted to thank, thank them on behalf of FAIR for spending time with us. So I'll pass it over to you, Lisa. Well, um, thank you so much for having us. We're really uh, pleased about that. Um, should we just launch into introductions and tell people who we are? Sure. Uh, my name is Sasha Ayad. I'm a licensed professional counselor in Arizona. Uh, started my practice in Texas and I've been working with uh, gender dysphoric youth since about 2016 in private practice. Hi, I'm Roberto D'Angelo. I'm a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst in New South Wales, Australia. Um, I've been working with gender dysphoric teens and young adults for a similar time period to Sasha, actually, since about mm -hmm. 2015, um, which is the time that I think we all saw a dramatic increase. And I'm Lisa Marciano. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a Jungian analyst in private practice in Philadelphia. And I've been working with uh, families and youth affected by uh, gender dysphoria since about 2016. And also I've been working with detransitioners since 2018. And I'm Stella O'Malley. I'm a psychotherapist based in Ireland. And like everybody working with gender dysphoric youth as well as their families. And I'm the founder and director of Genspect as well. Great. So we are uh, from the Gender Exploratory Therapy Association, and we launched this clinical guide in early December, and uh, Fair and Medicine was uh, kind enough to ask us to kind of reprise our presentation here for you. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and start the slideshow, hopefully. Okay, so uh, we have created a guide, a clinical guide for therapists working with uh, gender questioning youth. And um, before we before we um, go further, I just want to say we are going to have a Q and A at the end. So you can, if you have questions, you can hold them, or you can go ahead and write them into the Q and A um, box now, and and we'll we'll reserve about half an hour at the end. Um, okay. Okay, uh, this is the leadership team of GEDA. You can see that we're all here except for Joe, who couldn't be with us today. Joe is a, a psychologist who, um, who's from California. Okay, GEDA's mission is to promote the use of psychotherapy for the treatment of gender dysphoria. We were founded as a nonprofit in 2021, and we have, at this point, we have over 160 therapist members actually from pretty much the Anglosphere. Um, when you join GEDA, so GEDA is, it is, uh, the membership is open to therapists or people who are in training to become therapists. And when you become a member, it's a $25 annual fee. There is a private area where we exchange ideas. There are peer consultations every week. Uh, people might have a kind of quick clin clinical question that they put on there. Um, people share resources. So it's a, it's a pretty active area, by the way. Uh, we also do have a public facing directory, which you can put yourself on or not. So we've had a lot of people say, oh, I'd love to join GETA, but I, I don't want to be public yet. I'm not ready to be out. That's no problem. You can join GETA. You still get access to the private forum. You do not have to put yourself on the public facing directory. I will say that there are lots and lots of visits to that directory. I think we've had over 10,000 visits to that directory page within the past year or so. So there are lots of people looking for therapists. Um, we are uh, going to be offering more trainings and we're going to de be developing a library basically of webinars and recordings for therapists. So get a members receive discounts on trainings and then free access to all of the recordings. Um, our website is genderexploratory.com. 
And there you can download the clinical guide. You can apply to membership and you can also register for our upcoming webinar, which will be Sunday, January 22nd at 10 a.m. Eastern time and introduction to therapeutic work with detransitioners. Um, so do head over to genderexploratory.com if you want to do any of those things. I should also mention that, you know, the guide launched on December 4th and it's already had over uh, 2,700 uh, views. So we're, we're really pleased about that. We think there's a lot of people that are really interested in this. Okay. And Sasha, I will turn it over to you. Sure. So I'm going to just briefly go over the table of contents for the guide, because of course, in our presentation today, we're going to give you a couple of pieces of information, but this way you'll have a sense of what is in the guide itself. So the first chapter is an introduction to exploratory therapy for gender dysphoria. Um, number two is our background. So it talks kind of about what has been happening in the world of youth transition up to date so that you have that kind of context. Third chapter is assessment, so helping clinicians understand what factors to look for as they're assessing young people. We have a chapter dedicated to suicide because, as you probably know, this is a really big topic when it comes to justification for invasive medical intervention. So we, we kind of clarify what the data says on suicide in chapter four. Chapter five talks about what actually happens in the consulting room, so the therapeutic approach to gender dysphoria. And then we talk about some of the basic principles, which, as you'll see in our presentation, really reflect kind of good old fashioned psychotherapeutic principles and then how that applies to gender dysphoria. We talk about informed consent in a very extensive manner. And then we have three case studies, one of which you will see in our presentation today. So Alina, Emma, and then Stephen and Amy. So we'll talk about Stephen and Amy a little bit later today. Thanks, Sasha. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of talk about, um, I guess, the basic principles of what we think gender exploratory therapy is. Um, but I, before we do that, I kind of wanted to maybe address, like, why have we even created this guide? And one of the main reasons that many of you may know, some of you may not know, is that um, up until very recently, gender affirmative treatments were considered the gold standard treatment for young people with gender dysphoria. Um, however, recently some questions are beginning to emerge about whether this is in fact the best treatment. And we have looked at the research very carefully in collaboration with SEGM, the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine, um, and have also been very influenced by um, a number of independent systematic reviews that have been performed by Sweden, Finland, and the United Kingdom which have all raised serious questions about gender affirmative treatment. Um, and all of those reviews have found that the evidence is of low and very low quality and that the risks do not outweigh the benefits. And those countries have all quite significantly curtailed the use of gender affirming interventions in young people. In fact, Sweden now only allows those treatments to occur for the most extreme cases and in the context of a clinical trial. So those are very, very different ways of um, managing gender dysphoria compared to what is happening in other countries around the world, like the US and Australia. Um, the other thing I just wanna say at the outset, because this will certainly come up and we've been kind of confronted with this question many times, is that um, this is not conversion therapy. And I'm always struck when people kind of talk to me about psychological treatment for gender dysphoria, people seem unable to imagine that there is anything other than, well, if you don't affirm, what do you do? Well, you must be converting the person to turn them into a cis person. Um, so what we want to try to highlight today is that there is another option, like affirmation and conversion are not the only two options for how to respond to gender dysphoria that gender dysphoria is actually a very, very complex phenomenon and each case is unique. And what we try to do is kind of unpack and explore what is going on for each individual person to help them find the best solution for them. So looking at this slide now, um, as I was kind of just alluding to then, gender explore exploratory therapy is open to a range of outcomes. 
So basically this means that we're not trying to convince young people that they're not trans. We're not trying to turn them into gender conforming cis people with conservative values who are heterosexual. That's not at all what it's about. We're actually really trying to begin a process of exploration and dialogue that will help young people understand themselves better and figure out how they want to live and what kind of life is actually going to be most liberating for them and what kind of life will minimize the risk of any kind of harm. And we do know from a lot of the emerging research that there, there are risks associated with gender affirming treatments that are still emerging and are kind of we think probably still unknown, given that this treatment for young people has only been around for you know, a very small number of years. And on that, just going back to the research, and also um, we don't have any long-term follow-up studies that have followed young people who transitioned during adolescence well into adulthood. The longest term outcome study we have is one of the original Dutch studies, which only followed young people to around the age of 21. So beyond that, we don't know how these kids will be doing in their 30s and their 40s, um, and whether the outcomes will be good, whether they'll be, or whether they'll be problematic. Okay, this is really key, I think. Point two is that gender dysphoria emerges in a context. And what do we mean by that? Um, this is a different way of thinking about gender dysphoria compared to the way standard gender affirming approaches think about gender dysphoria. Um, in our conversations with many of our colleagues who take a gender affirming approach, there's a, there's a sense that gender is seen as, a, as an innate quality that just is. It's not something that needs to be considered or explored or thought about or certainly not questioned. And um, we, on the other hand, as psychotherapists, understand gender as a subjective experience. It's a subjective internal experience. And like all subjective experience, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Like people are not just born with a particular sense of themselves. Our senses of ourselves develop over time as a result of social, family, formative experiences. And so gender dysphoria is no different. Um, you, it's not possible to understand gender dysphoria without looking at the context within which, uh, in which it emerges. And so that means looking at the family, um, the developmental history, um, the young person's experience at school, relationships with peers, um, their particular interests, um, what's going on politically in their immediate environment. So there's a lot, there are a lot of strands that can come together. And the way um, I've written about this is that I, I see all of these things as intersecting factors and systems. And gender dysphoria is often like an emergent phenomenon that results, you know, when these systems come together in a particular way in each individual case. And so gender, dys in, in our exploratory therapy, we really want to look at the entire big picture of all of these different aspects of each person's life. So this kind of relates to point three, which is that exploratory therapy is developmentally informed. So gender dysphoria, again, um, we feel it's problematic to see gender as just an isolated phenomenon without looking at it in the context of what is going on developmentally for each individual. And when we spend time talking to young people with gender dysphoria, we often find that the trans identification or other gender struggles are often very intertwined with kind of pretty normal developmental struggles and stresses. You know, for example, um, you know, separation and individuation is one of the central tasks of adolescence which is, you know, we all know that adolescents become kind of defiant and kind of want to define their own rules and do their own thing and be their own person. And, you know, which is something that we encourage and applaud. But we sometimes gender dysphoria and trans identification becomes, a, becomes kind of recruited to manage that struggle when the young person is, 
is experiencing difficulty separating or asserting their own identity. And so it's so important to actually spend some time really understanding the young person's history and where they're at developmentally before we make any assumptions about whether their stated gender identification um, really represents something that is enduring or whether it's actually something that's kind of serves a function in that person's life to help them manage other more complicated stresses and difficulties. Point four, okay, so um, we consider and address comorbid conditions. Again, um, just to point out um, how we think about this as psychotherapists, is that comorbidity, I think it's now very well known that gender dysphoria is highly comorbid with a range of other mental health problems. Um, things such as anxiety disorders, depression, eating disorders, um, neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism and ADHD. So there's a, there tends to be, um, at least in the lay press, and also I think amongst many clinicians, a belief that these kinds of comorbid problems are all secondary to gender dysphoria. So that um, minority stress or the stress of growing up as gender diverse um, results in problematic experiences, which then lead to depression, anxiety, et cetera, or somebody who is not able to live in their true gender as a result of that will develop depression or an eating disorder, et cetera, to manage those feelings. Um, look, that is a possibility. However, it's really much more complicated than that. And in some ways, um, things could be the other way around. Like we have often found that gender dysphoria is a way of attempting to manage other difficulties such as depression, anxiety, um, um, self identity disorders and confusion. So we don't, um, and we don't necessarily like to think about comorbidity as separate encapsulated conditions. So one of the problematic ways that our mental health system has evolved is that you know, we often see people with a list of diagnoses, like, and um, there's no sense that these are all occurring in one person and they're all most likely to be part of a big picture global response to whatever this young person has experienced or is struggling with in their life. So comorbidity is very important, but it's also important to, to not kind of forget that all of these problems that young people come to us with are likely to be fundamentally related. Um, okay, um, sexual development and gender identity. This is a very important issue. Um, again, many of us working in this field have found that many of our patients have um, kind of anxiety or conflicts around sexual orientation. I mean, I myself found it surprising that considering you know, where we are in the 21st century and how far gay and lesbian rights have advanced, that many young people are still um, extremely ashamed and um, conflicted about same-sex attraction. So it's often not apparent at first, but after kind of spending time with young people and exploring how they feel about their developing sexuality, it's often shocking to hear really a lot of internalized homophobia. And in some cases, trans identification is a way to try to deal with that. That, you know, it can be, in fact, a, a young patient once said to me that this was a natal female who identified as trans. Initially, she discovered she was attracted to other girls. Um, and thought she was a lesbian. However, really struggled with that, felt very ashamed, she was bullied. She then um, decided, or she realized that she was trans and she said to me, um, kind of after some time exploring this, that being trans was much more socially acceptable for her and than being a lesbian. I know it kind of sounds shocking, but um, these kinds of um, biases and prejudices are much more widespread than I think any of us would like to realize. Um, 
It, okay, number seven, it is, it's a process that occurs over an extended period of time. We often hear about young people attending gender services where, I don't know, at best, they may have four to six appointments before they're um, commenced on gender affirming treatments. And I'll add gender affirming treatments in case any of you don't know what they are, are varying combinations of social transition, which means helping the young person change the way they look, changing their name, changing their gender signifiers, the, the way their name is recorded and their gender is recorded at school and so on. Um, that is sometimes followed by medical gender affirming treatments, which are either puberty blockers, which halt the development of secondary sex characteristics or cross sex hormones, um, which then precipitate the development of cross sex secondary sexual characteristics. And although surgical interventions more commonly happen during adults, young people, including adolescents, are having gender affirming surgeries as well in small numbers, um, including mastectomies. Um, so we see young people, we hear about and see young people who have had a small number of appointments with a psychologist or a clinician at a gender service, um, and then are approved for gender affirming treatments. Um, we just having worked as therapists for a long time, understand that developing a complex understanding of any human being cannot occur in four to six sessions. It takes a long period of time. It takes the establishment of a kind of safe, trusting and relatively close relationship with the therapist for the kinds of complex issues that we need to unpack to, to emerge. So um, you can't do this in a handful of sessions. It's a process that occurs over months, years. Um, and I just want to point out that, you know, our, um, the concern that what we're promoting here is conversion therapy. Um, often one of the um, criticisms we hear is that we don't allow young people to go on gender affirming treatments until they've had endless years of therapy. That is simply incorrect, as you'll see from our case example, that we do not stop people from having gender affirming treatments. We raise a lot of questions about it and make sure they understand what they're doing and why. But ultimately we respect patient autonomy and it's not, not up to us to act as gatekeepers or stand in the way of what young people ultimately decide to do in conjunction with their families, of course. Um, okay, number nine, sorry, number um, seven, the issue of suicidality. Um, many of you who work in this field have probably heard that um, suicide is, ex is highly overrepresented in trans youth and it's an extreme risk and that if we do not immediately provide gender affirming interventions, young people will be at risk of suicide. That is simply not supported by any evidence. In fact, most seriously, we do not have any convincing evidence that gender affirming treatments reduce the risk of completed suicide. It just, there is no evidence that it does that. We may have some evidence that there are short-term reductions in suicidal ideation, but overall the risk of suicide continues through the transition process and even after the transition process. So as therapists, we have complex and subtle tailored ways of helping young people manage suicidality. We don't need to um, initiate uh, irreversible and serious interventions to help people manage their suicidality. And finally, informed consent. So we don't think young people can really um, provide informed consent to these serious treatments unless they actually understand why they want them so much, where, they're mo where, they're, where this desire and distress is coming from. And unless they've actually spent some time thinking about how gender transition will ultimately help them. And that involves also thinking about the risks 
the unknowns and the potential problems. And so we also think it's important to be very honest with young people about the, about the research and about the very low quality evidence that we currently have. Um, without that, um, informed consent just can occur. Thank you, Roberto. So um, that was really thorough. And I think that probably um, covers really well some of these points as well. So I'm just going to touch on what exploratory therapy is not. And as Roberto discussed, it is not conversion therapy. And just for a little context here, conversion therapy is a term that describes a type of intervention or practice of attempting to turn homosexual people heterosexual. And thank goodness the field has come a long way and this is very much considered um, not only unethical, but it is known to be ineffective and is no longer practiced. But what's happened in more contemporary times is that this label of conversion therapy has been applied to any type of therapeutic interaction or relationship which attempts to help a, a young person or, or any person with gender dysphoria explore what the meaning behind it could be or anything essentially that is not a concretizing or an affirming of their stated gender identity. So this has been uh, really unfortunate because it conflates two very distinct practices, one being an attempt to convert a gay person to a straight person and any attempt to just simply help uh, an individual understand themselves better, particularly in the context of their emergent gender dysphoria. So number one, you know, exploratory therapy does not attempt to convert anyone. And as Roberto mentioned, because it's open to a, a broad range of possible outcomes, there is no kind of predetermined goal that the therapist has in mind. Instead, it is a process. And as we know, in therapy processes follow the individual. And so it is not a conversion therapy. Number two, it doesn't assume that trans identification is universally adaptive. Uh, within the affirmation model that Roberto has described, there is the assumption that if an individual claims a transgender identity or claims to have uh, some other kind of gender identity, that it is the role of the therapist to follow the lead because the assumption is that it is adaptive and it is almost a way of kind of allowing the patient's true self to emerge and the therapist's goal is to stay out of the way of that process but as we've touched on so far human beings have very complicated and sometimes subtle ways of attempting to manage distress and conflict within themselves and sometimes that can happen in the context of an identity exploration especially one that is accompanied by a desire to radically transform their body, their sense of identity, their sense of self in the world, the sense of how they relate to others. So transgender identification in some cases may be the most adaptive and expansive way for an individual to live. And we certainly have seen cases where that's true, but it's important that the therapist not assume that that is true universally with every single person presenting with gender dysphoria. So that's why it's important to explore and give individuals a process because that will help them to discern whether their identification is adaptive or not. Number three, we don't assume that gender affirmative interventions are universally helpful. Um, in addition to some of the points we've raised so far about the kind of um, ways that people may recruit a gender identity to manage their distress, there is also the biological reality of how challenging these interventions can be on a person's physicality. Whether or not a person's identity ends up being adaptive in the long run, individuals still really have to contend with the medical complications and the medical burden that they will you know, accrue from being a patient, a medical patient for the rest of their lives. And these are really serious um, pieces of information that, at least in my experience, a lot of young people simply don't have. A lot of young people who are presenting in the clinics with gender dysphoria are under the illusion, sometimes unfortunately, 
kind of uh, facilitated by adults and authority figures in their life that it's a pretty simple process to take this or that medication, have this or that surgery, and then become your authentic self. And the reality is, even if those procedures may be beneficial and helpful to someone in the long run, there are many, many transgender adults who feel like they were not given the, the full picture of what medical complications may be waiting for them down the line. So we believe that in order to provide a true informed consent, um, we have to keep in mind that there's a potential that these interventions may actually be experienced as harmful by the individual rather than only be experienced as something that is helpful to them. And this kind of goes along with point number four here, which is that we do not encourage the obfuscation of biological facts. So there is um, in the affirmation model that Roberto laid out, there is a lot of language which attempts to sanitize the complicated interventions that often accompany gender affirming care. So something, for example, like top surgery is a, a euphemistic term applied to double mastectomy or bottom surgery is often used for penile inversion and vaginoplasty or phalloplasty. And the truth is these are incredibly complicated surgical interventions and hormonal interventions that many physicians claim to be actually experimental. So it's important working with a young person that they understand that a, a medical intervention or a, a round of hormonal treatments or a surgery cannot biologically change them into another sex, that there are serious um, trade-offs made with any kind of medical intervention, particularly those which have a poor evidence base behind them, which are experimental. And um, I would say in addition to this, biological facts can also be important within the therapeutic context because sometimes young people may not have a full understanding of how their own biological realities impact things like mood, their experiences, their sense of distress. So being really uh, deliberate about clarity and honesty around biology is a really important part of gender exploratory therapy. So I think that wraps up what therapy is and is not. And I think I will throw it over to Stella to present our case. So this is the case of, I'm going to call uh, Stephen Stephen for the first section because when uh, Stephen came for counselling, he presented as male and he didn't, um, he didn't have any interest in pronouns and he was waiting for medical transition to reveal his womanhood and he felt it was just play acting really to call him anything else except Stephen and he him at the time. At the time when he'd come for therapy, he had identified as a woman for about six months and he was not in a good way. He had um, a very morose, he felt a very flat effect. He had dropped out of college. He didn't really know where he was going. He'd gone back home and he had a very, um, it felt like a very big plan and he was waiting for hormones and his parents had asked him to go to therapy before he started his medical transition. So in a way, the, the, the therapy was something to get through on his way to his great plan. And he felt it'd be inauthentic to present as a female while he was waiting effectively for, uh, to go through the therapeutic process, come out and become a woman. That was his, his plan. He did have a lot of anxieties and there was a lot of behaviors that we could work at with the um with the um therapeutic approach and the very much the gender exploratory approach but it's it's kind of like seeing the whole person and not just seeing somebody as often sasha would say a walking gender identity that this was a person who had a lot of complexity and a lot of difficulties and was not happy on a lot of different levels in life he was showing signs of um, autistic traits and uh, very much black and white thinking, very um, 
a kind of a literal understanding of things and hyper fixation about different issues. Not only that, he was um, he had some compulsive behavior, especially around his body hair. And he was spending hours and hours in the bathroom removing all body hair every day. And this was causing a huge amount of anxiety and it was very compulsive. And in a way, for the therapeutic process to be a success, to start off with, if we go to the next slide there, Lisa, um, we kind of had to kind of establish a good therapeutic alliance and make sure that we were able to work together as, um, as therapist and client and for us to realise that there was, there was a lot going on. Stephen had a very close relationship with the, his mother. You could say it was an enmeshed relationship. They were very, very, very tight. It was very emotional. An awful lot of emotional fights and stuff. And then there was a very distant relationship with his father and a distant relationship with his sister. He was spending a huge amount of time online. As I said earlier, he had dropped out of college. He had started originally with um, a, a course called Computer Science. And uh, that didn't go well. And this derailed him and in a way shook his identity because he had been known as a brainiac in school. He was the very clever child and he went to college and lost his identity as the clever person because he didn't thrive with his computer science course. Then he moved over to electronic engineering and he didn't thrive with that. And that completely derailed him. And he ended up online watching anime video games, a huge amount of um, online life, and he disconnected. He had had friends, but he had disconnected completely. He was very, very lonely. And whenever we discussed his sex life, he identified as a lesbian, but he'd never had a girlfriend and he'd never had a sexual experience. His entire sexual experience was online. And whenever we spoke about that, this was an issue. Stephen was squeamish. Stephen didn't want to talk about it. And so with somebody who was kind of stuck in in the, the future, the future was going to be he was going to get through the therapeutic process. He was going to start to medically transition with hormones and then he was going to go back to college and be a great success. That was the grand plan. And for anybody who's a therapist who's working with somebody like that and they have a grand plan, our job is to make sure that we have some sort of kind of deeper relationship to kind of make sure that there's a bigger understanding of the person because sometimes plans don't go to plan and um, we realized that really myself and Stephen working together realized that it was an impediment to the therapeutic process that he had this idea that therapy had to be got through and then he was going to transition and so we took away we agreed to take away this arbitrary rule that um, he was going to go through therapy and then medically transition. And we kind of proposed, how about you're free to transition whenever you want, whenever you feel that this is um, your right decision. And in a way, there is uh, there's merit in that because it's very important that the client has agency and feels autono autonomous and that they know that their decision is their decision. And it's certainly not our decision as therapists to make it for them. And when a client is, is kind of giving you the power to make decisions for them, it's not helpful for anybody. It's bestowing too much power on the therapist. It's uh, taking away agency from the client. And it's much more valuable that the client realizes this is their decision solely and utterly and totally. And that brings with it more depth and, and more understanding of the choices we make in life, be they good, bad or indifferent, it's very important that each person has their own agency. So we go to the next uh, slide there. So, yeah, with uh, I do, I do often think that, you know, as a therapist, you know, you can talk about gender affirmative therapy, you can talk about gender exploratory therapy, you can talk about any type of therapy. Again and again, the results show that the most effective type of therapy is when you've got a good alliance with the client. It's the relationship that really matters. And I've seen that in my work again and again. At the start, when I was first a therapist, I was much more fond of 
of you know, kind of tricks and techniques and strategies. And then I realized it's just it's turning up and it's being authentic and it's going there and it's it's going, you know, alongside somebody. It's kind of working shoulder to shoulder with somebody. And with Stephen, it was very important that we had a course of psychoeducation, which meant a kind of definite kind of information had to be imparted by the therapist about anxiety, how anxiety works, how the brain goes on fire when you get into an anxiety episode, how was circadian rhythms? He was he was effectively living this nightlife where he was getting up in the middle of the night and having his dinner. He was sleeping all day. It was it was a very dysfunctional life. And how his autistic traits might be impacting his understanding. This is all really, really important so that somebody gets to a, a kind of a fuller understanding of themselves, as well as that addressing compulsive behavior, figuring out what is the actual, the cycle of behavior. Starts off maybe with a distressing feeling, then you might turn to compulsive behavior to relieve it. Then there can be a sense of relief. And then it's a temporary fix. Back comes the distressing feeling and around and around you can go. And so the more we explored anxious patterns of thinking and where they might have derived from and how lonely Stephen was, and how ruminative he was, and how it was all on the big gamble. It was all about when I transition, my life will start. Really, nothing has happened until then. Everything has been a write-off. And it turned out that Stephen had a very, very sad childhood, a very difficult childhood, that there was an awful lot of bullying, and he was very, very traumatized by what had gone on during his childhood. So we go to the next one there. So, yeah, as as we progressed in the uh, therapeutic relationship, um, we discussed naming conventions. We discussed when a parent gives a name to a child who owns the name up until adulthood. Do the parents own the name? Certainly some names mean an awful lot to parents. And we discussed, you know, in and around what what does a name mean? and who owns it, and who owns a pronoun, and who doesn't. And just this was done in a very, very kind of thoughtful manner, and also with the openness of when Stephen wanted the me, the therapist, to, to, to use Amy and to use she, her, I would do that. However, as a therapist, I think it's very important that we bring in the right to make a mistake, that it's a very important, valuable learning opportunity and that we can't live in a world where mistakes are going to be pounced upon and misread. Um, parents often can be very intent within a therapeutic process and they are not the client. The client is the person in front of you. And the parents were very distressed around, um, let's say, the name and conventions, the fact that Stephen changed over to Amy within the process when he started to medically transition. And so I'll move now to Stephen became Amy. Stephen started medically to transition. She came in with a very different voice, very different clothes, very flamboyant silks and satins and colors. Now this had been somebody who was very flat effect, morose, baggy clothes, turned into this kind of theatrical persona, flamboyant and uh, a, a voice, a different voice, and um, very excited. And on, on many levels, you could say, wow, th this is a transformation. And yet there was there was crying jags. There was a lot of deep emotional distress and there was an increase in suicidal ideation. And so yet again, you know, the human condition always explains to us exactly how complex it is. So, so it wasn't a, a magic wand, it wasn't perfect. There was a lot of complexity with this transition. The therapist often needs boundaries of steel with um, parents because it is complicated if the parent is paying for the therapy and it's not going the way that the parent wants, that can be very difficult. Our job as therapists is to hold space, try and build self-awareness in the client and give them the freedom to act from an informed point of view, whatever way they want, if we move on. So key moments in this therapeutic process was the parents joined a support group. There's, there's a few support groups. Genspec does a lot of information around parent support groups around the world. And it was key for the parents to realize things were not going the way they wanted. It was devastating. They weren't happy. And sometimes that happens in life. 
And what we do then is really our choice, but it does happen. And another key moment was Stephen realizing that he was going to transition after therapy was an impediment to the therapeutic process and we needed to go deeper. We needed to have a more trustful relationship. A very significant part of the therapeutic process was discussing the trauma around bullying. Stephen had been bullied all through his childhood. It was it was absolutely devastating, harrowing stories. It was, you know, there were his surname was Farrelly, the Farrelly freaks. And it turned out the mother had also been um, had also been bullied. And we have a system that is often recommended by gender exploratory therapists that perhaps um, after maybe every six sessions or every four sessions, the parents are invited into the session so that everybody can discuss the process. Because often it's a family very impacting the family because there's demands around names, there's requests around pronouns. There's a lot of behavior that impacts the family. So often the therapist might bring the, the family into the process. And so every six weeks, we met with Stephen's uh, parents and it turned out that bullying had been a feature in both parents' lives, but especially in the mother. So that created a more of a bond and less hostility. Stephen's lost identity as the as the clever kid was a major issue in college. And then euphoria from Amy when she transitioned over and she was utterly euphoric and yet crying all the time and yet increased suicidal ideation and the very complicated feelings around that. When um, Amy started to transition, she became more able and honest and willing to speak about her signs of autogynephilia, which is the male propensity to be aroused by themselves as a female. And so when you have autogynephilic traits, you might want to transition because you're aroused by the idea of yourself as a woman. Amy was willing to discuss this and also willing to discuss her porn activity that she really was quite extensive and was very much based on anime and was very fetishized and so there was an openness that arrived into the process once Amy started to transition of that you can make what you will and there was also an awareness as the therapeutic process continued of how her ASD traits were impacting how her OCD traits were impacting and how her anxiety was impacting this is a deep and complex process that took quite some time Go to the next. I think this is the last um, slide. And so the developmental outcomes really, at the end of it, Amy did live alone. She was aware that life was not going as, as what she thought. She was disappointed in the medical process. She didn't turn into the Cinderella that she thought she would. And she was aware, rather than always chasing the next fix, which some people do when they have a plan that doesn't go right, she realized actually... I, I need to kind of become aware of myself and my limitations and how some self-awareness and self-acceptance crept into her understanding of herself and realizing chasing the next plan isn't always great. And then lastly, she became, she changed her college course and left behind the Brainiac identity and, and did a filmmaking course, which is very far from the electronic engineer that she began with. So it was a very complicated process and lots of sadness, but also self-awareness arrived and um, Amy decided she was going to stop there. And I welcomed her to come back anytime in the future. So we might discuss this a little bit further. I think, Lisa, you're going to do some dialogue, I think, with Roberto. Yeah, so I'm going to be playing the role of Stella and <laughs> uh, Roberto will be playing the role of Stephen. So we, we have some some dialogues just to give you a sense of kind of what, what actually happens in the session. And hopefully we can do this and then maybe have just a few minutes to kick this around between us and then we'll move to the Q&A. Okay, so thanks for coming in. I've had some emails from your parents, but I'd rather you filled me in on everything you want me to know about your gender exploration and, and just about every, everything else that's going on too. Well, the main issue is that my parents um, won't accept my real self. They don't want to accept that I'm a girl. And to be honest, it's not me that has a problem, but them. They've always been very kind to me before this, but they just don't understand the trans thing. Oh, I hear you. This must be very difficult. And, and I want you to know that I'm your therapist and my professional focus is on you, 
not your parents. So all I know about you is that you're 20 years old, that you attend UCD and that you came out as a trans woman six months ago. Can you tell me a little bit more about your life before you came out? Sure. Well, I've always been a quiet person. I'm a gamer and I spend most of my time online. I have a sister, Kiara, who's younger than me. Um, I'm studying electronic engineering at college, but I dropped out so as to give some time to my transition. And I, I do plan to re-engage when I'm fully transitioned. Okay, so that was, uh, I guess, the first dialogue, maybe the first session. Let's see what happens maybe a year or so later. Tell me about your school days. I really didn't enjoy school. No one liked me. And it was embarrassing for me when I was a kid because everyone called me gay. I wonder why the boys decided you were gay. It's amazing the crazy ideas a mob can latch on to sometimes. Yeah, I know. I suppose I was quite a bit different. I was into computers when they were into football. And my parents weren't part of things like the way other families are. We considered a bit of a weird family. They used to call us the Farrelly Freaks. Ugh, that sounds really cruel and distressing. Can you tell me more about that? Well, I was bullied from the age of about eight until I left school at 18. They all hated me. They used to write messages for me online and then pile on when I answered. They created memes of me and my mother having sex. Ugh. They called me a pervert. They all hated me. Oh, wow. That, that must have had a huge impact on you. It sounds like a cruel and sustained campaign. Did you have any support? I just kept it a secret from everyone. It would have only upset my mother and whatever they could have done would have probably made it worse. It was horrible at the time, but I'm over it now. And this is another year later. Um, we've been through a lot over the last few years and you believe it's time to end our process together. I wonder what obstacles you foresee in the future. I think I need to be careful about gaming and spending too much time online. However, I'm satisfied that we've done enough. I have a lot more going on now and so I haven't time to be analyzing myself all the time. Since I started back in college, I'm so busy. I kind of wonder what the problem was all along. Did I have too much time on my own in my bedroom? I'm happier now that I'm a woman though. Okay. So um, let's let's kick it around for about 10 minutes and just what are, what are we seeing in, in this uh, really um, interesting and well-presented case? Thank you, Stella. I mean, I, I'm happy to start. One thing that, that I really noticed is that when Stephen came into therapy, he was kind of living this very um, isolated, self-involved, almost solipsistic life with an obsession on self-transformation. And as the process continued, of course, he did end up embarking on some aspects of the, the physical transformation, the gender transformation, but he also looked outward. He was more engaged in life. He had other things going on. He was a bit more self-aware about some of the patterns that had tripped him up historically, such as gaming too much or being online too much. And I think whenever we can help a client to go from a lot of kind of self-obsessive introspection to looking towards the outside world and engaging with the outside world, that really does show a lot of positive growth. So that, that's something that stood out for me. Well, yeah, very, that's, I agree with you, Sasha. And one of the things that I kind of also think about a lot with some of these children and teenagers that I see is that the, um, the gender issue becomes so completely preoccupying and it's almost like their focus focus narrows completely on gender. And, um, and, and I know in this case, the compulsive behaviors were also kind of like very time consuming and um, really were a major focus of this young person's life. And so I often think about what is the function of this narrowing of attention onto simply the gender issue? Like what is it that the person doesn't wanna think about or can't think about, or is what is too distressing to acknowledge outside of the gender issues? And it seems like in this case, there was a lot, like there was the trauma there. Um, 
of bullying and being different at school. And I guess we haven't really even, um, we don't have enough information to understand the complexities of the parental relationship, but I imagine there's probably also stuff there that, um, you know, this person may be keeping out of their awareness by focusing everything on gender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of one of the things that really stood out to me was um, when Stephen said you were talking about the bullying, Stella, and Stephen said something like, "Yeah, it was bad at the time, but it's fine." Mm -hmm. I never, I never talked about mm -hmm. it, but it's fine. So, you know, Roberta, you were raising this issue of what's being kept out. What is, what is what is perhaps the preoccupation on gender holding at bay? And it seems to me that one of the answers might be a whole lot of feeling that hasn't been uh, formulated, articulated and, and felt, you know, we have to feel our feelings at some point. And it, it doesn't seem like he felt uh, understandably, he didn't really feel safe enough to have a lot of feeling about that at the time. Yeah. And there, there's an element of self-loathing that sometimes happens when somebody has been bullied, they, they internalize all the, uh, all the attacks. And I, I think there's almost nothing more alluring in life to be told that you can be somebody different, mm. a different person with a different name and different pronouns. And nobody will refer to that old person that you hate being. It's it's such a, an alluring concept. And this is a, a, a kind of it can be, a, you know, it can be a false concept insofar as, you know, that that great book by John Kabat-Zinn. And he said, wherever you go, there you are. And you still wake up in the morning in the same way and you still have the, you know, the creak in your knee or whatever. And so I think there's a, there's a danger when somebody has a grand plan, whatever that grand plan is, when there's a grand plan and you're the therapist and you're looking at them thinking, and what happens when the plan doesn't come to pass the way you hope it will? And that I suppose that is our, our job as therapists to hold that tension of not intruding, but also saying, lots of things can happen you know yeah and along those lines i'm thinking about the way sometimes busyness and projects and uh kind of self-development can become a defense against feeling and against really sitting with the uncomfortable scary difficult to metabolize experiences that a person maybe is not ready to quite deal with or is afraid to deal with so it can be really tricky as therapists because what looks like a process of growth and of individuation or you know pursuing something that one is passionate about is sometimes hard to differentiate between um, having some kind of magical plan that you're going to follow in order to like pseudo develop yourself like it can look like development but sometimes it's actually an attempt to escape a real development that is calling you to to address something from your past or something really painful so it's very difficult and that's precisely why i think it takes so much time to help an individual really figure out what of this is the surface story telling the real story and what is there here that needs to be looked at beneath the surface it's very challenging to figure out and you know sasha that's a great point and i think one of the ways how one of the ways you might uh separate those two things like when is it when is it a, a healthy developmental call and and when is it maybe a defense or a kind of psychic retreat is um the quality of the thinking around it mm -hmm. and if it's very kind of encapsulated and impervious to uh interrogation if it has a kind of stuck fantasy quality about it which you know Stella one of the really nice things that Sasha already alluded is he came in with this this really kind of rigid fantasy it's like i'm going to become a girl and then everything's going to be great and i i just need to reveal my womanhood and and you helped him hold it more complexly so that you know because it, it's like yeah this might be right for him and it will probably solve some problems and create new ones because that's just the reality of life and so you know if you're if you're dealing with someone who's not holding that level of complexity then they might be kind of bur burrowing into this uh, kind of ideology, I guess, to uh, avoid thinking about things or feeling things. Yeah. I think it was also, in, oh, sorry, Stella, you go. Oh, well, I was just going to say, I was only going to quote you, Roberto. I remember <laughs> Roberto saying once, um, we often talk about simplifying the narrative, but sometimes we need to complexify mm -hmm. the narrative. And it's always stuck with me that very often, 
these days we need to complexify mm-hmm. the narrative. Yeah, look, I totally agree. And I think that, I mean, I think we see this all right in psychotherapy with all of our patients that, and not just gender dysphoric patients, that patients often have a particular idea about what is causing their unhappiness or their misery. And, you know, or or maybe they don't have any idea, but often they do. But then through therapy, they kind of come to realize that it's actually much more complex than they thought. Mm -hmm. And there are so many more factors and issues that are kind of involved in why they feel the way they do. And sometimes they kind of discover that the problem is actually something else, completely different to what they originally thought it was. Um, I mean, I was just going to add to that. I thought it was interesting that, you know, Stephen had never talked about his bullying at home. And, you know, and I think this is interesting because, you know, parents also have their own histories and their own um, limitations. And, you know, and sometimes there are um, kind of um, areas of the relationship that are not explored at home because of those limitations. And interestingly, these both parents, right, Stella had histories of bullying. Yeah. And so it's interesting, there was a kind of blind spot or a kind of prohibition in the family on talking about that. Um, or e- yeah. even a fear of, of the pain, a fear of... Oh, right, um, yeah. Yeah, so Stephen was kind of protecting them, wasn't he? Yeah. 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 I, I remember my old college lecturer when I was first trained for psychotherapy used to say, what's going on now? What's really going on? Mm-hmm. And very often with, with clients, they come in maybe saying, I, I need to leave my husband. And 12 weeks later, they're talking about how they're drinking vodka every night. You know, <laughs> that's not that unusual that there's a story. Yeah another story mm-hmm. and we're used to that as therapists that's par for the course so I think I think it's important that we just hold space as the stories come in mm-hmm. from the person and and just one more thing about this thing with the parents is to the extent that he avoided talking about the bullying or even having feelings about the bullying as a way to kind of remain aligned with his parents and protect them that made it may have made it even more important that he find a way to separate from them and so mm-hmm. as i think you alluded to earlier roberto the the trans identification may be at least partly maybe serving that purpose I think very often it is serving that purpose. That's a great Mm -hmm. point. So should we shift gears a little bit and look at some of the questions within the the Q&A box now? Sure. You know, there are two that I want to just take a swing at right out of the gate. (laughs) One is um, someone asked, do we vet therapists? So GETA is an all volunteer organization. We're pretty small and we're pretty new and we are not in any position to certify that any particular therapist is good. The, the process for becoming a get a therapist is to agree with our membership statement, which is on our website at genderexploratory.com for all to read. Um, and you also have to fill out a fairly rigorous number of um, questions about how you heard about get what your approach is, what do you think about uh, conversion therapy, um, and that kind of thing. And I can tell you that everyone on the directory filled those questions out convincingly. So does that mean they're all good therapists? It absolutely does not. Um, Does that mean they're all gonna practice the way you want them to practice? Nope. Uh, We have have created a service where you can find therapists who at least agree with these principles or say that they do. And we've taken some measures to uh, verify that they are there in good faith. And up after, up past that is up to you. So as you ever would with any therapeutic encounter, you will need to kind of do your due diligence. And, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you that in general, the people that I've met that have joined GETA are, are fabulous. They're really strong clinicians. Of course, that's not going to be true across the board. And there's there's no way for us to police that. So I hope that's clear. The other thing is that someone, um, you know, put, put in a, a very heartbreaking uh, message into the questions about not being able to afford uh, gender exploratory therapy and and really needing help now. And I just wanted to share there are some free and low cost resources. Uh, For one thing, we're going to be launching a new website just about any day that will have even more resources on it. And also there is this wonderful podcast called Gender A Wider Lens. 
And I don't know if you guys, one of you wants to kind of put your, the podcast website into the chat so that people can find it. So it's a free weekly podcast that is done by Stella and Sasha. It covers all kinds of things. There's really, um, there's a rich back catalog now. So that's, that's a free resource. And then also, and I'm going to turn this over to you guys in a second, Sasha has a subscribe star and Stella has a Substack. And these are, again, low cost ways that you can have access to advice and, and uh, maybe some kind of coaching from, from someone with a really uh, sophisticated view of this. So I'll let you guys say more about that. I would like to add that more therapists than people think often offer low cost counseling mm -hmm. to a certain section of their clients. I don't think that's very well known because we're known to be expensive, but it's very, very, very common. The issue, frankly, I would say is often not the cost. You might find somebody who will do it, but it's it's there isn't enough therapists. Mm -hmm. That is actually, to me, the, the very pressing issue at the moment. And it is difficult to find therapists. But often if you ask and if you explain that many therapists will will be willing to work on some level with you financially. Do you want to um, share your sub stack, Stella? Oh yeah, I'll put it in. I'll put okay. It in. Okay. So flying in there. Okay. And um and Sasha, do you want to say more about your subscribe star? Uh, sure. My subscribe star is really a resource I set up when Stella and I talked about this recently, which you'll hear soon. But basically, I found myself often sharing the same kind of suggestions or um, offerings or pieces of advice or guidance in these parent phone consultations that I do over and over and over again. And so I thought it might be more valuable to share this information in a slightly broader scale, in addition to a place where there's a kind of community feature. So my it's like a kind of parent membership group where I post monthly videos that review topics that come up frequently in these types of consultations. And I do live Q and A's where parents can submit questions to me and we talk through them in a Zoom chat once a month it's it's really great because a lot of the parents there are also just kind of a wealth of wisdom and experience themselves. So it's really nice to have a place where I can share this information and also parents can connect with each other and our um, accompanying discord server is incredible because I, I know parents who have found other local parents and have become friends in real life with people and having that in person support is just tremendously valuable. Um, these online opportunities are amazing. For example, we're all here with you, but having people in person who understand what you're going through and can, you know, relate to your experience is very powerful. So that's a little bit about my uh, parent membership group. Could I just add one more thing? Um, I set up the, the Gender Dysphoria Support Network a couple of years ago, and it's it's a really beautiful organization, if I say so myself. It's it's run on the basis of Al-Anon, as in the parents are helping the parents, and they they have a lot of parent groups and it's parent led. And it's, you know, like when AA was started, Alcoholics Anonymous, it was started by Bill, who, who was an alcoholic. And then a few years later, his wife started Al-Anon because she realized when you love somebody who has uh, an issue, you can get as obsessed with the person they're obsessed with. Let's say, for example, Bill was obsessed with the alcohol. She was obsessed with Bill. And so that that's the kind of the, the way the parents feel so helpless and overwhelmed and lost and incredibly lonely. I really do recommend find the parent groups. Go on to Jensbeck and you'll find some parent groups. And there's so much peer and parent support there and you'll find your own group you might find some of them aren't you at all but you'll find your own group and it, it's, it can be very very helpful can okay. i also add that um mm -hmm. if if parents or anybody wants to have access to i guess the science to go to the society for evidence-based mm -hmm. gender medicine mm -hmm. um which kind of regularly updates and we have a team of people we're all involved with Segum, but there are a team of very brilliant minds who kind of critique and analyze the research as it emerges and also the past research. And you will also get updates on what's currently happening around the world. Um, so it's a useful site for information of that kind. Okay, um, here's a question. Is exploratory therapy for preteens best done individually as child therapy or with parents and or siblings as family therapy? I mean, I would, I'll answer that generally. I think that generally for preteens, 
um, it's not really possible to work with the child unless you work with the family. And I would probably say that family intervention would be the starting point to do family therapy. I don't know if you all agree with that, but I think that's my yes. would be my approach. Completely agree. Mm -hmm. I think family therapy is a very big, um, sh should be a very big part of this because mm. it impacts the family. There's so much more being asked of parents to do with names and social transition and pronouns that it, it needs it needs a lot of input with the family mm. if, if you're if you're really addressing the issues. Okay. Um, here's another question. Adolescence is a time to explore who we are. Is exploring using names wearing clothes of the opposite sex, does, does it always lead to medicalization? I mean, I would definitely say no, it does not always lead to medicalization. And I think it's really tricky because, you know, the way the family and the authority figures in the child's life respond to and kind of hold space for this identity exploration, I think probably plays a role in whether or not it does. So if a young person is experimenting with names and appearance and aesthetic and style, and the parents become very anxious about this, for example, and take them to a gender clinic and wonder if this means something is wrong with my child. And that could unfortunately snowball into a pathway towards medicalization, whereas I've certainly worked with young people who, you know, their parents were, you know, honest with them about their concerns, but perhaps were able to take a little bit more of a relaxed approach and a young person can work their way through it. I think what's challenging is that the culture is just replete with voices and ideas that continue to nudge children down that route. So like young people who are experimenting with identity are sometimes asked, when are you going to transition? Do you want us to change your name on this record at school? So it's very important that the adults and authority figures in a young person's life hold it with a lot of care, because I think that can make a big difference in the long run. I don't know what you guys think, but. Well, you know, this is a great question because of course, you know, I remember I, you know, I went through my own um, identity exploration when I was a teen. I, it's a little cringe to think about now, but <laughs> there it is. And, you know, this is always something to be welcomed and celebrated. And, and of course, not everyone who plays around with names, presentation, haircuts, foot clothing, of course, they don't all medicalize. And, and it's difficult. Um, it's difficult to sort of say one thing that's true. However, uh, we do know that each step of transition tends to cement the identity and create more pressure to undertake the next step. So for example, if you are, um, if you have a little boy who is very effeminate and uh, you, you affirm him and tell him he's a girl and dress him as a girl and he goes to school as a girl and he does all the girl things and he goes to the girl sleepover parties. As adolescence looms, that little girl, so I'm thinking about someone like Kai Shapley, if you know that case, as adolescence looms, it's going to seem like a disaster to think about your you know, your, your genitals getting larger and your voice deepening and getting an Adam's apple and a beard, it's going to seem like a disaster. And it's going to put this pressure on for puberty blockers. Once you're on puberty blockers, we know that most kids go into cross sex hormones, probably for complex reasons that I won't say more about right now, but it's almost a hundred percent. Um, and, and so then, then you're now, now you've, now you're Kai Shapley and you've gone from being a very cute little, you know, five-year-old trans girl to being put on puberty blockers, to being put on cross-sex hormones, and you're permanently sterile and likely don't have any orgasmic function. And uh, then there's, you know, then there's a uh, pressure to maybe go through surgeries because, you know, if you're, if you're attracted to men, uh, you know, how, how's that going to work? So maybe you feel like you have to have bottom surgery. So the, it, there is a way that it can sort of be like a runaway train, but of course it's not always the case. I think that's a really good point in terms of like, there is a very um, complicated path for families to navigate between, you know, kind of allowing some playful exploration, but not concretizing it in the way you're talking about, Lisa. And I think there is research which does suggest that social transition, you know, which means consolidating with a new name, 
you know, a whole change of gender pronouns and so on and so on in a formalized way, that that does um, reduce the likelihood that this child may change the way they identify down the line. They're more likely to remain trans identified. Um, I mean, I was going to add too that just kind of this touches for me also on the you know conversion therapy issue is that when I, when I'm working with young people, I kind of embrace their um, gender challenging and gender non-conforming behaviors and you know experimenting with dress and different interests and so on and so on. And to me, there's a very important question that seems to get missed, which is, um, you know, why do we need why do why does this child feel like they need to medicalize yeah. in order to be, I don't know, like you were describing Stella, like with Amy, you know, like she was kind of flamboyant and and very kind of different to the kind of yeah. constrained lockdown person that Stephen was. But so to me, there's always a sense of let's embrace gender diversity. Let's uh, let's help kids be different and non gender non-conforming. But like, let's raise questions about why what, how will surgery and hormones help in that process? Is it really necessary? In fact, I spoke to a colleague recently who um, works with a lot of, a therapist who works with a lot of trans kids. And she said to me, um, I mean, if you don't encourage um, medical and surgical treatment, you know, kind of when the kid requests it, like, aren't you, you know, aren't you kind of trying to get rid of their trans identity? And so there's kind of this strange sense, I think, in a lot of clinicians that unless you support medical treatment, you're kind of trying to make the child cisgender or you're trying to make them normal or um, conforming. And I mean, that is just so far away from how psychotherapy works. Yeah. In fact, psychotherapy has always been quite radical and kind of has been, you know, has challenged um, social norms and social conceptions, you know, of what's normal and what's not. I'd love to see um, in the future a kind of a, a realization that we could we could like, for example, you know, Stephen could have done everything Amy did do. Yeah. You know, drop drop the electronic air engineer and go into a film course, wear silks, wear makeup. And if we could have a more freeing kind of approach towards gender, that gender diversity was more celebrated rather than pigeonholed into a kind of trauma, distress and medicalization. It feels mm -hmm. like it feels like something from the last century as an approach. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we need to. <laughs> areas. Yeah, we do. We we need to turn it around so that people can feel free to ex explore all the different facets mm -hmm. of their personality without feeling that they need to medicalize it. I think it would be more helpful. So yeah, I'm often... going to. Oh, sorry, so go, go on, go, ahead. go to the next question. We could talk about this forever. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so here's one. I'm a counselor who runs a public Facebook page dedicated to abolishing transition for minors. I don't see how I could counsel trans identified people without being seen as biased against transition and risking professional sanction or legal pen penalty. However, I would like to provide help, that, for example, therapeutic support groups online to parents of ROTD kids. Is there any training available for those who want to provide this kind of support? And I'll, I'll just say quickly, well, yes, Getter will be offering trainings in that. And uh, so you should think about joining Getter. But I oh. wonder if, Sasha, if you and, and uh, Stella, if you guys, or, or Roberto, you too, if you guys want to talk about um, working with this population when you are really visible, and how do you kind of thread that needle? Um, I think for me, I try to be, again, it's always a fine line. I mean, that's what psychotherapy is. We're always walking a fine line. But I try to be pretty um, transparent from the beginning of therapy about what the young person should expect. Um, I have been pretty successful in in having a practice where I can establish these long term relationships with young people. Um, and it doesn't interfere with the work. But as people become more visible online, that becomes challenging. I think it's important to let people know what you are offering them. Stella, you covered this beautifully when we did this seminar last time, you're offering them a kind of therapeutic process, which will help them get to know themselves better. 
But like we talked about with Stephen slash Amy, if a young person with the support of their parents or under the care of, you know, their their family support system decides that transition is the best option, you're not necessarily there to stand in their way. And, you know, this came up actually recently for me in a therapeutic context, a client confronted me about our different perspectives. This is a client I've been working with for a long time, so we have excellent rapport. But I, it dawned on me and I asked this person, do you know why I have the stance that I have about pediatric gender transition? And he said, you know, actually, I have no idea whatsoever. So it opened up this opportunity to talk about, you know, some of the outcomes in medicine that young people often don't know about and some of the ways that young people end up rushed down the process. And a lot of times clients um, are able to have some pretty reasonable opinions when they're of a certain age. I mean, that conversation with the 13 year old would not have gone over well, but I think there's an opportunity to be transparent about what you are offering and why you have certain views that you have if you're confronted about it. Generally, when I meet with a new family and I'm onboarding a young client, what I say to parents is, you know, just tell them my name is Sasha and that I'm a therapist who works around gender. And that way it's a little bit more uh, slightly, um, it gives us the opportunity to connect face to face and meet each other first. And I always offer a phone call with the young person before they make the decision. And I tell the young person at the end of the day, this is your call. You have to decide if it's a good fit for us. So I give the client a lot of autonomy and an opportunity to connect before we establish any formal therapeutic relationship. So I, I hope that's helpful. I know I, I find it, that it was very interesting, Sasha. I find it very important that I, I'm, I suppose, fully transparent in, in my own views so that I can feel that I can enter any relationship authentically. And I, I think that will carry the day because I, I don't have to worry about that. But I do think it's valuable. And I think parents should consider it more than parents do. Parents often shy away from this. <laughs> what I'm about to say, but I think it's valuable to say, you know, there's there's different theories, different understandings of gender dysphoria. Some people think it's a an essence within you, and that could be the kind of gender identity theory. And other people might have a more developmental understanding of gender dysphoria, where you can develop a, a, a deep distress and it can feel like your only position is to is to transition. And there are two different understandings. The net result is the same. We don't know, but I, I do come from a development, m developmental model. That is where I, I land, but that doesn't mean we couldn't understand each other because the distress is the distress and we can always meet and work and ameliorate those symptoms. And so I think there is, there is a, an authenticity and a, a strength in being straight that can yeah. can really kind of go go very far mm -hmm. not everywhere <laughs> yeah i mean i also think that as a um as a clinician i guess we you know we try not to i mean it's, it's important to kind of evaluate our own biases and our own mm -hmm. kind of anxieties and to try to be um clear about reality i suppose and so i think i mean i think the important way to, to kind of frame this rather than being opposed to transition is to say that I mean, is to look at the science and like the truth is we just don't know we really do not know whether these treatments are ultimately going to be helpful for young people mm -hmm. and you know the going to what i said before about low quality and very low quality evidence which pretty much all of the evidence in this area is basically what that means is that none of the studies can really tell us whether the improvements that were seen happened because of the treatment or in spite of the treatment. So it's, I mean, that's where we're at. And so I think it's pretty important to say, well, mm -hmm. given that, given that we don't know, do we want to take the risks that we do know about happen with these treatments? Or should we try an alternative that is a lot safer and probably potentially a lot more liberating and freeing, mm -hmm. which is psychotherapy? Yeah. And, and I'll just add that I think you'd be surprised how many young gender dysphoric people yeah. actually want a process. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, some yeah. don't, some are very rigid, but you, you might be yeah. surprised, you know, well, this is a yeah. neutral space where you can just explore things like a lot of them actually really want that. Okay. A um, couple of quick ones here. Do you recommend yeah. a special informed consent form for gender exploratory therapy in light of conversion therapy? And the answer is yes, we have actually forms um, in GETA. If you're a member, you can avail yourselves of them. They were worked on by uh, one of our members who consulted a lawyer who has a kind of special release and will be developing more uh, resources like that. Um, and I also wanted to say really quickly, somebody said, um, can, uh, can school psychologists join? And the answer is absolutely. Um, so I, there were some other really good ones here. Uh, um, well, this is interesting. Um, how do you manage your treatment of gender dysphoria versus the other comorbid conditions that often present alongside a trans identification? How do you set clinical priorities? I mean, I think everybody does this in different ways. And, you know, I suppose that, um, I mean, I guess as a psychiatrist, I have the, the luxury of also considering medication. And sometimes, you know, if a young person is very depressed or extremely anxious and disabled by their anxiety, um, those things become priorities for treatment if they're kind of getting, even especially if they're getting in the way of a therapeutic process. Um, so, you know, you would probably want to refer to a psychiatrist or physician to help you with that. But I mean, overall, I think, I mean, psychotherapy is not really a symptom focused treatment, like we're really trying to understand issues of identity, um, who am I, um, what's constraining my life, why am I so lonely, you know, these kinds of broader questions that I think underlie most forms of psychological suffering. So I guess that's the way I would think about it. Um, okay, here's another one. I am a school board member in California. The gender spectrum approach to gender identity is being, whoops, I just lost that one. Where'd it go? Oh, I'm so sorry. I think I answered it, but I'll, I'll pull it back up and I'll, oh. I'll read it. Okay, go ahead. I'm a school board member in California. The gender spectrum approach is being pushed in my district. How do you feel that other perspectives such as yours presented here could be introduced for consideration within the school to best serve dysphoric youth? My school district is in a rural area, not an urban setting. So I, I sent this person uh, the link to GenSpec's education page. Stella, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, I would recommend as a, as a first step, it can be very effective and has been very effective if a member of a school or if a school staff or school parent sends GenSpec's kind of it's a brief guide for schools for gender. And it's 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 very if you look it up, it's it's it's, it's a lovely guide because it's it's very it's neutral and it's gentle. And it begins a conversation because after that, you could say, could we meet perhaps and discuss this? There's a couple of points in this guide that I think could be interesting for our school. I'm not saying we take in the whole guide, but there's a couple of points that could be interesting. And we're also putting up, I think it's going to be next week, a sample school policy again oh. for. Yeah, we've been working on it. It's, it's really extensive and I think it's brilliant. And again, for people to be able to kind of say, if you look at point nine, I think our school could really do with this. You don't you don't have to ask for the whole thing. That's not mm -hmm. what it's for. It's mm -hmm. for to kind of begin conversations. And I think it's it's very important that, you know, this is a very heightened atmosphere. So you have to kind of pick what you want to make. Make sure you know what the point you're making. It might be just about toilets. It might be just about one specific thing, maybe stealth transition where, where the school might be transitioning children without the parents knowledge just one particular thing have yourself very organized and very versed in that point and don't leave that point just just make that point because it can be more effective I think than trying to kind of talk about theories what I said earlier which is the gender identity theory and the developmental in a way schools aren't interested in that they're in the practical they're very busy they've got an awful lot of challenges if you can just pick one point and make it I think you can get further and you're beginning conversations and starting to bring in maybe you know people often bring in Jens Beck and stuff for to do training but that's down the road that's six months down the road start with something small and simple 
Well, and, and if you can get the ear of any of the school psychologists, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, especially perhaps somewhat older school yeah. psychologists are wondering what the heck has happened. Mm -hmm. And you might let them know about Genspect and Geta. And, you know, we're, we're sort of in this process where, where we don't have a choice but to build up new institutions. And it's a, a long, slow road, but in some sense, we've got to get started somewhere. And yeah, and it's it's conversations, just a conversation that is backed up with an email. That, and also, like, if you if you can make sure that you, you limit your conversation, you don't try and tell them the entire history of gender, because it, it gets very. It gets How very... would you know about that, Stella? Why are you raising that point? <laughs> Having been that soldier, I have learned that you have to you know, not get the splutters and not say everything. And instead, just start conversations and back it up with an email, back it up with a text that has a link and then revisit it. it it's very difficult, but it's very doable and people think it's less doable than it is um i say we're we're pretty much at time but um there is a question here that i think is really interesting so maybe this will be our last question is it damaging to the gender dysphoric patient to refuse to use preferred pronouns or new names mm. i i tend to think it's really all about the approach the relationship, the way the conversation is had, um, the dynamics between parent and child. I don't think in general there's any blanket thing, which is somewhat benign. I mean, of course, there are certain things that are definitely damaging, but there's not one blanket thing that if you allow your child to do this or not do this, you're going to destroy the relationship. I think parents have to kind of trust that the bond they have with their child can withstand some friction. Um, and yet, if the information or the conversation is delivered in a way that is compassionate and understanding, and you're trying to hear the child's perspective, at the end of the day, it is always the, the parent's job to think about the well being of the child in the big picture and the long term and make decisions every day about what a child's allowed to do and not to do. So I, I tend to think, no, it's not a guarantee to destroy a relationship or to damage the child. I mean, I would add that I think the only way it could be damaging is it, uh, in some situations, it kind of becomes a complete um, impasse in the family and a kind of mm -hmm. standoff between the child mm -hmm. and the parents. And both sides dig in their heels deeper and deeper. And, and it does result in a kind of breakdown in the relationship. And so I think you know, that is the, I think the primary risk is that if, um, as you said, it depends on the quality of the relationship and ideally there would be a kind of negotiation, you know, of something that the parents feel comfortable with that also, you know, doesn't um, completely um, kind of restrict the child's freedom. But, um, but yeah, I think that's the risk is if you kind of lay down the law in a very draconian way, mm -hmm. um, it can be problematic. So what you both just said is, which uh, Sasha says all the time, it's um, it's it's not about gender really. It's about yeah. the relationship. So as as uh, as long as as the pronoun discussion doesn't become a, a power struggle that uh, yeah. harms the relationship, then uh, then yeah. Um, so you know we we didn't get through all the questions today. If you uh, if you want to. Um, contact us you can always do so at info at genderexploratory.com um, i want to remind you that we are having a webinar on clinical work with detransitioners on uh, january 22nd and you can purchase tickets for those at the Geta website you can download our clinical guide at the website as well it's free and we want to we want to share it. Um, on our website, there is a recording of our previous uh, um, webinar, which was done in early uh, December, but I know I think FAIR will also be making this available. And uh, what else? And what am I, what am I forgetting? I, I guess not. Just, um, oh, I, I, what I wanted to say was, if you are a clinician, I really encourage you and to join Geta if it if it feels like this is in keeping with the way you think about things. So we, we want to grow the organization and get stronger. So we welcome you. And and if you have a therapist or if your child is going to therapy, send them the guide. 
tell them about, you know, Geta, because uh, just do your little thing to spread the word because yeah. there, there's a lot of noise out there. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. So thank you so much, everyone. We're um, we're really thankful that you joined us today and uh, we wish you a good rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.